man was created in the image of God. Therefore, I believe that man was created to celebrate. That's what church is all about, is celebration. To celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. To celebrating the coming of together of God's family. You know, it's really awesome. The past couple of days, Elaine and I have been down in San Diego uh, celebrating the wedding of Elena's nephew, her, her sister's son. And, uh, you know, whenever there's a wedding, it's just a time of celebration. And in our family, literally, we come from all the corners of the United States. And when everybody comes together, it's just a flat, awesome time. And it was interesting, of course, in the, uh, the music that was picked out for uh, the, the dancing last night. They had some of the, the, the newer stuff. And then they had some of the good stuff. You know what I'm talking about right here? Now, this is a song goes back all the way to 1981. Number one in the Billboard charts by Cool and the Gang Celebration. Celebrate good times. Come on. (laughs) There's a party going on around here. A celebration to last throughout the years. So bring your good times and your laughter too. We're going to celebrate your party with you in the church edge. The title of our lesson this morning is Celebration. Be turning your Bibles over to Luke chapter 15. There we find three parables. The NIV version entitles each parable. One was... The parable of the lost sheep. The second, the parable of the lost coin. And the third, the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. But in keeping with our theme of celebration, I've chosen the titles. Number one, the parable of the rejoicing shepherds. The parable of the jubilant housewife. And the parable of the partying father. Let's go look at this audience that Jesus was speaking to. First one. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Right here we we get a visual of the ministry of Jesus. Quite simply put in the Greek it says... Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all, it's not gathering around him, but it's literally drawing near to Jesus. So in essence, Luke is giving us this picture, Jesus teaching, and the tax collectors and sinners, they're coming in close. But on the outside of the circle are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and they're muttering. This man welcomes sinners. And even eats with them. And you know, Jesus was the master teacher, so in everything that he taught, he had a little something for everybody. And I believe he's got something even for you this morning. Let's look at the first parable. The parable of the rejoicing shepherd. Verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I found my lost sheep! I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. What an incredible, touching story right here. A shepherd that had a hundred sheep. As you may or may not well know, every evening, the shepherd counts his sheep. See, all good shepherds have accountability. 
for each one of their sheep because he doesn't even want one to go missing. And in fact, in this particular account, we find that's exactly what happens. Nine of the, 99 of them are, are, are doing awesome. But that night, he misses the one. And the Bible says he leaves the 99 for the sake of the one. And right here, we're beginning to understand the value of a soul in the mind of the great shepherd. And of course, it's a, it's a beautiful picture that Luke paints for us, that Jesus spoke about, is that he searches for the lost sheep until he finds it. No matter the obstacle, no matter the time of day, he is not going to stop until he gets that little lost sheep. And then what a, what a beautiful picture in verse 5. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Now sometimes we, we look at other Christians that we, so to speak, carry in the Lord. And we view them as burdens. And yet that's not Jesus. Jesus finds the errant sheep and he joyfully... Are you with me right there? He joyfully puts them on his shoulders. And he goes home. And then Jesus says, he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Hey, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. Now, prayerfully that night, they're not serving mutton. You know what I'm talking about? But right here we begin to understand the value of each soul in the mind of God. And the value that each soul must have in our minds. You know, when I think about the lost sheep, I, I, I think about, as some of us had, family pets that, have, that we, we really loved a lot. Uh, I was raised in a military family. And when I just turned five years old, my dad uh, got moved from Washington, D.C. to Bermuda. He was stationed there. And so, even though most people would think moving to Bermuda would be awesome, of course, I left all my friends. And so, dad was trying to cheer my brother Randy and I up, and so he, he bought us a, a little Dalmatian puppy. That wasn't good enough. <laughs> and then, then we went to to this pet store and, and he bought us each a cat. Randy had this calico cat that he named Pretty Kitty. And I had this little scruffy little black cat that I named Jinx. Of course, a lot of people always thought I, I named it Jinx because black cats aren't supposed to be so lucky. But that wasn't it at all. Back then, there, there were only three TV channels in all the world. <laughs> and they all shut off at 7.30. And one of my favorite shows was the Huckleberry Hound Dog Show. And one of the cartoons on that show was Pixie and Dixie, two little mice. And the cat that always chased them around but never got them was Jinx. And so I named my cat Jinx. I love Jinx. But he's kind of an independent cat. <laughs> and we moved around some more and we, we eventually moved back to D.C. Then we moved to Boston. And then when the time came at the end of my fifth grade year, we were going to move on to Chicago. You know, there was the movers. Well, sadly, a few days before we moved, Randy's cat, Pretty Kitty, got run over. So we had our first funeral in our family. No, I'm not kidding. We, we, we buried her right on the hill. Put a little cross there. Oof. Well, the first time I ever saw my dad pray. But I still had jinx. Well, love all, I don't know what happened. He never told me. But the, the movers came, and it was a couple days process. And so at the end of the second night, all the stuff was moved out of the house, and we were going to take off super early in the morning from the little hotel that we were in to travel to Chicago. 
but we couldn't find Jinx. And Dad says, he's, he's just gone. And I said, Dad, can we just go back and just see if Jinx is there? Can we just see if Jinx is there? Finally, you know, after my tears, we went back to the house. We're standing there, and lo and behold, out of the forest comes Jinx. We got Jinx, moved on. Many years passed. And it's the end of my senior year in 1971. And I take him to the pet because I knew he, he, was, he, was, he was acting a little lethargic. It turns out that the veterinarian said that, that he had these tumors. He, he had cancer. And he only had a short time to live. And I still remember when the time came, I, we had to put him under. Uh, Dad came to me and he says, you know, son, let me... Let me drive you and, and Jinx to the veterinarian. I go, no, Dad. I'm going to walk there. And I still remember just carrying Jinx in my arm for about, about a mile and a half. That was, that was my cat. You know, it's interesting if, if, if you're a family that, that has family pets, just how much you love them. And that's really the heart that they're trying to convey that sometimes we, have, we miss right here with the shepherd how much he loves the sheep. And yet, you know something? There aren't going to be any dogs, cats, or sheep in heaven. <laughs> Only the souls of men are eternal. I hope I didn't wreck up your day right there. <laughs> and it occurs to me that sometimes we've, we, we've really lost... In, in, in this time of great revival that we see here going on in the City of Angels Church, we, we're beginning to lose that sense of the value of a single soul. I still remember when Elena and I went to, to Boston back in 1979. And it was a little church. It was kind of a dying little mainline church of Christ. And they'd only had two baptisms in the previous three years. Well, lo and behold, Elena had been studying with a with woman for a few days right before we got there. So on our very first Sunday, on June 3rd, and was baptized. I'll never forget the elder's wife, Helen, coming forward to me. She was just so sweet. She just literally grabbed my jacket. She goes, starts crying. She says, you don't know how long it's been since we've seen a baptism. And it just hit me. Wow. She valued that one soul that was baptized that day. Well, the movement grew, and it grew great, and the Lord blessed us in unbelievable ways. There was one month here in Los Angeles where we had 465 people baptized in one month. That was awesome. And then the Lord put his heavy hand upon us for our sin, and the baptism stopped. That's when Elaine and I were taken by the Spirit up to Portland to, once more, a very hurting situation. In a church that used to be about 300, there were 25 faithful disciples. And they'd stopped giving contribution. There was no hope. But we started preaching the word and calling people to be sold out disciples. And I'll forget that fall. If we'd have a baptism. Oh, we had a baptism this week. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We had a baptism. And we once more remembered the value of a soul. And sometimes even here, uh, we'll see, as in today, I think we'll have something like eight baptisms. Amen. But sometimes people are talking and chatting and they get up and, oh my God, I need to go to the bathroom. And you've totally lost sight of a value of a soul and the very miracle of God. You know, even this, as we watched this morning, we got to see Crystal be restored. Wasn't that powerful? I mean, they travel all the way from Denver, Colorado, just to find revivals. That's how thirsty they were. You know, there are a few different churches along the way between here and Denver, those thousand miles. But that's how rare what you have is. That's how far people will travel to once more have that living water. 
You know, it occurs to me that Jesus quite purposely uses numbers here. The 99 and the 1. And I believe that sometimes people get cynical about the use of numbers in the church. But by golly, I mean, even God in the Old Testament has a whole book that he decided to call numbers. So I guess we better get comfortable with numbers. Now, if numbers become our goal instead of pleasing God, obviously things get get out of whack right there. But numbers are very important to the Lord. You know, God this year has, has blessed us and unbelievable. As of last Sunday, in the first 268 days this year, we've had 274 additions. Is that incredible, church? That's amazing. But 186 baptisms, 38 restorations, and 50 place membership. And like Justin was added last week in Orange County, he came over from our former fellowship. It's, that's, that's pretty awesome as a place membership. Now, as awesome as that is, here's one that hits your heart. We've had 84 fallaways. We got to do something about this. It's time for us to get the heart of the shepherd right here in Luke 15. It's time for us to leave the 99 and to go after those that are lost. To go after those that do not know their way back home. And we're not going to stop till we find them. And one of the things that we've begun to do is we've organized in every one of the regions shepherding couples. And I'd like at this time all the, the shepherding couples to stand on up so we could, we could recognize you at this time. There we go. You know, shepherding couples, shepherding couples, that's probably the first and last time you're going to be thanked. So enjoy it. <laughs> but we came together last Saturday night, and it was, it, was, it was a historic night. We brought the regional leaders together with the shepherding couples. We have 16 shepherding couples in the congregation now. And we talked about the fact that we've got to be like this shepherd, and we've got to care about the one. How was it done? There was accountability by the shepherd. And so, we're beginning shepherding accountability. Starting this Sunday, each of the shepherds in the region will keep track of the follow-up studies to make sure that every new disciple gets every single one of the follow-up studies. We just can't have this big celebration after these incredible studies and then whammo, nothing. Exactly right, Kip. Come on. Secondly, we're going to look at, as Michael Kirshner put the term, contribution irregularities. <laughs> now, that was his term. Are you irregular? <laughs> You know, we understand if somebody's irregular, there's something wrong. Especially if it's a contribution irregularity. You know, the old jokes aside, you know, someone may miss a contribution here and there. You forget your checkbook or whatever. But someone that perpetually misses it shows that their heart is not with the Lord. And finally, the obvious. Who's missing that day from church? And we're going to determine to make sure that they get served communion, that people reach out to them, and that people feel taken care of, and they know that they are missed that day. And I really believe in that way, we will be able to capture the heart of Jesus right here. And it's very interesting, it says, he says, I tell you in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. I don't know about you today, but I was fired up when Crystal came back to the Lord. Let's celebrate. Amen, church? Let's go to the second parable. And people think this is a redundancy, that Jesus just told a second parable to emphasize the same things. Well, let's look ahead. Verse 8. Or suppose a woman. Well, that's a little different right there. Or suppose a woman had ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin! In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 
Now the actual word for coin right here in the Greek is drachma. A drachma was one day's wage. Think about it. If you had a, just one coin for your work. Now some of you work minimum wage and you make about $70. If you work eight hours a day, you, you make about $70. That's how much that coin would be worth. We, we've got a few brothers and sisters that have a salary of 100 k That little coin would be worth $400 a day. Shh. That's a cranky coin. <laughs> and the Bible says right here, this woman loses one of her ten silver coins. Have you ever lost your billfold, your keys, your phone, or your sunglasses? I do it all the time. And I've even got a spot where I just perch them right there. So I won't forget, but I keep forgetting to put them there. And, and you know how the panic is? Where's my billfold? Oh my, where did I put my billfold? Or the keys? Oh my gosh, my phone! I won't be able to exist! The other day I was in a panic and it turns out Elena had put my keys in her purse. But all of us have, have that sense of panic when we lose something of value. Now some things to look right here. First of all, it's not by chance that Jesus uses a woman. The choice of a woman is fascinating and in fact gives you the clue to what this is all about. Biblically, a woman has always symbolized the people of God. In the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 16, the woman was the young woman that grew up that God married. In the New Testament, it is the bride of Christ. Revelation chapter 21. So we already understand, while a woman, Jesus is now talking about, figuratively, the people of God. So... Secondly, he says, the woman takes a lamp. Well, what does the lamp do? It guides. It shows the way. The lamp is the light. The lamp is the Holy Spirit. The coins are very important. Coins have no sense of understanding in and of themselves. They're inanimate. In other words, they can't find their way back to their owners. You've, you've never signed your billfold go... Here I am, you know, <laughs> go back. <laughs> Souls cannot find their way back to God without the woman, the church, searching for them. Interestingly, we find that she rejoices and she calls her friends and neighbors together and she says, Rejoice with me, I found the lost coins. Interesting enough, friends and neighbor are also in the feminine gender, representing these are either present or future people of God that are going to join her. And then in verse 10, the difference. In the same way I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. In other words, the rejoicing is now, not in the future. In the first one, it was in the future there will be rejoicing in heaven. Right here in the second parable, the rejoicing, the celebration is now, and that's exactly what takes place when we see the eight people going to be baptized this morning. Are you talking about, we don't wait for the celebration up in heaven, we're going to be fired up today about each one of these souls being baptized. Are you with me right here, guys? Come on. You know, I have a, just a, a special blessing. It's every Sunday night, uh, different brothers send me from all over the world the good news from their particular congregation. And I kind of distill them on into uh, what, what I call the good news email. I thought that was a creative name. Yeah. <laughs> and so I send the good news email out to all the leaders and anybody that wants to, to read about it. And it's, it's good for my heart. Because you, you, you have a lot of hits, you know, as a, as a disciple. Yeah. But when you start collecting the good news email, and you, and you remember the Lord is working. It encourages you. And uh, one particular one just really fired me up this past week. It's from Orlando, the remnant group there. And there was this uh, single mom named Yana that was just baptized three months ago. It was really cool because last week, 
She was pregnant when she was baptized. Her baby was born. And she named the baby Nehemiah. Why? Quote, because God has taken away my broken life and rebuilt it with my amazing relationship with God. Now, interestingly enough, she's been reaching out to another pregnant woman on the job. And her name is Jessie. Well, last Sunday, they were counting the cost with Jessie in the afternoon, and then she started to have some, some pains. So everybody's panicking and everything, so they, they rush her to the hospital. As it, as it turns out, it wasn't directly related to the pregnancy. And so the encouragement by all was, hey, you just need to, to go home. And she says, no, no, I've got, to, I've got to share with the nurse. I've got to share with these people before I go home. And she goes, what am I doing? Let's just go back and let's finish counting the cost. <laughs> and that night at 10 p.m., Jesse became your sister in the Lord. Does that fire you on up right there? You see, Yana was a part of the church. She wanted her friends to become part of the church. And so she was that woman searching by being guided by the Holy Spirit, by the light of God, by the lamp of God, until she found Jesse. See, we need to get a a deep conviction about this. Jesus in Luke 19.10 said, I have come to seek and save the lost. That was his purpose when he physically walked the earth. You know something? Jesus is still here. Where is Jesus? Jesus' body is the church. And so what is the mission of the church? It's to seek and save the lost. Jesus hasn't changed his mission. Now I've got to ask you. Is that your mission? Is that your mission? Do you have a visitor here today? If you don't, did you try with all of your heart to have one? If you don't, you begin to lose purpose. And that light will begin to dim in your own life. But thank God for the jubilant housewife personified in our sister, Yana, and our even newer sister, Jesse. Amen, church? Third parable. The parable of the partying father. (laughs) Actually speaking, New International Version calls it the parable of the lost son. That's really not true. It's the parable of the two lost sons. Let's go see if we can understand that better. Verse 11. Jesus continued. There's a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth while living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Let's just stop right there. Right here, when the English says that the father gave him his share of the estate, the actual Greek right there is, it says the father gave him the life. His estate. It's the portion of the father's life that he would give him. So what's happened right here? If the father gives him the life, his life, in effect, when this boy leaves the father, he views, he regards the father as though he were dead. Now we understand the father here is going to represent God. So anybody that falls away from God, that leaves God, in effect... Regards God as dead. We also see right here that for a while after he left God, he thought it was awesome. He thought he had freedom. He sets off for a distant country. Now remember, this is obviously talking about a Jewish young man. So the Jews all lived in one country, the country of God, Israel. To go to a distant country means that he's no longer in Israel. He's totally fallen away. Not by chance, but by God, there's a severe famine. Any 
Anytime you leave God, hardship is going to come upon you. Interesting, a lot, a lot of people then get even bitter towards God. I can't believe God's making it hard for me. That's after they left Him. Now, interesting right here, you've got to understand how intense this is. This boy who used to have all this money now hires him out to a citizen of that country, a Gentile. And then, what's his job that he gets? He gets to feed the pigs. Now, he's a Jewish boy. Pigs are anathema. Pigs are just, just something that the Jews loathe. And then it says, the Bible says he gets to the point where he's even longing to fill his stomach with pig food. And he doesn't even get pig food. You know, when people leave the Lord, they do things that they loathe. They do things they never even thought they would ever do. That's how far out their people get. Verse 17. When he came to his census... You know, that's the requirement after you fall away. There's got to be a day and time when you say, listen, the hardship of the world is just nothing compared to being with God. And the Bible says he comes to a sense, he says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll sit out and go to my father and say to my father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to the father. Now, if, if you guys remember when you were young, you, you knew you did something wrong and you started to prepare your speech for your dad or your mom. You know what I'm talking about right here? Shh. This guy says, okay. Dad, I've, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Uh, just make me like one of your, your, your hired men. This guy admits failure, his unworthiness. He deserves nothing. He takes on full responsibility of his independent life and accepts any consequences. That's what it takes to come back to God. And then he says, so he got up and went to his father. You know, there are a lot of people that have fallen away that think, man, I've really blown it. But they just don't get up. They feel so sorry for themselves that they just don't get up. Chinese proverb, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. We have fallaways here today. I challenge you. Come to your senses and get up. Humble yourself. Admit your failure, your unworthiness, that you deserve nothing. And take full responsibility for your independent life. And accept any consequence of coming back to God. And then God will welcome you home. Look at this next section. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Son said to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe. Notice, he doesn't even get to finish his apology. He says, Quick, bring me the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast to celebrate. For the son of mine was dead. He's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And the church said, What a picture. You know, whenever I study with someone that's fallen away, I almost always go to Luke 15 in this particular passage. I don't focus in on the prodigal son and her sin. As a matter of fact, I focus right here In the middle of verse 20. I focus in on the Father. Because people who have fallen away have a very distorted view of God. He says, I want to show you who God is. And it says, while this young man was still a long ways off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, and he ran his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Think about it. The Father is watching He's been watching a long, long time. He's been watching and he's waiting. And all of a sudden, he sees that old familiar figure coming over the mountain. He sees it. And hope arises. And the Bible says he sees them and he's filled with compassion. It's very important because a lot of people think that when they're coming back to God, God's pulling out the lightning bolts and the sledgehammer and he's coming to get you to make you pay. (laughs) Now the Bible says if you're filled with something, if, if a glass is filled with water, there's nothing in it but water. 
Right here the Bible says that the Father is filled with compassion. There's nothing in God but compassion to the one who's willing to come back to the Father. Now get this. The Father sees him. He's filled with compassion. Now the Father just tears off and he's running towards the kid. Can you picture? God is coming after you. You make the first step. God is going to come to get you. He throws his arms around him. She kisses him. The son starts his speech. And he says, hey, hey, bring the robe. Bring the ring. Both of these things, single sonship. Bring the sandals. No longer will this be a person that's a servant. But he's going to be in the house of the king. And then the Bible says, very interesting, bring the fatted calf and kill it because we're going to have a feast and celebrate it. You know, this is very important. Remember now, who was the, who, who was the audience Jesus was speaking to? Go back. Verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around. They were drawing near to Jesus. But the Pharisees teach the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So the issue is Jesus is eating with sinners. Jesus tells this, this, this parable where he says, Hey, this prodigal son comes on back. Of course, that's the tax collectors and sinners. He comes on back. Not only does the father eat with them, he gives them a robe. He gives them a ring. He's even part of the preparation. He's not just eating with them. And they're not serving leftovers. They're serving some steak. God is fired up when His people come back to Him. Are you with me right here, church? You know, when, 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 when someone is falling away from God, if they can just grab that this is our God, a God filled with compassion, they're going to want to come back. You know, I remember many years ago, it was kind of fun to see Eric down at the wedding yesterday. We were just talking about all the different tennis matches through the years and and there was one very important tennis match when he was in the tens. It was a sectional in Southern Cal. And the first round, Eric won. It was awesome. The second round, he was playing a tough player. And uh, you may not know much about tennis, but he lost 6-0, 6-1. In other words, he got his butt kicked. <laughs> of course, now Eric is a typical male. He walks off the court and he wants to blame anybody but himself. Dad, where were you? I said, uh, what, what, what do you mean? He said, I didn't see you. I said, son, I, I gave up my seat to the mom of the person you were playing. But I've been here the whole time. Oh, okay, dad. A lot of people, when they leave God, they think that God no longer cares. How untrue that is. They're a lot like Eric, thinking, oh, out of sight, out of mind. That's true for you. That's why you fall away. It's not true for God. He's longing. He's looking. He's right there. You can't see Him because of the darkness of your sin. But God is just waiting for you to come to your senses and to come back to Him. I challenge anybody that's fallen away in this auditorium, Make a decision today to come to your senses. And God will receive you back. Full of compassion. And he'll get that robe. He'll get that ring. Get you a new pair of shoes, spiritually speaking. And then he's going to kill the fatted calf. We're talking steak tonight. Let's read about the second son. Verse 25. So meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, has come on, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, interestingly, we find the older son, but he's not in the house. Now, biblically speaking, each parable, if you're not in the Father's house, you're not in a right relationship with God. Oh, he was still living with the Father. Just like there can be people that are still coming to church, but they're not really in the Father's house. Are you with me right here, guys? You see, notice, though, the heart of God's the same. In the first parable, when he sees the son coming back, God takes the initiative and starts running towards the boy. Right here, he sees that the older boy, though he's been obedient to the commandments seemingly, he's outside of the house, he's muttering, he's grumbling. Yes, that's the Pharisees and teachers of the law. They're not really in the house of God, even though they know a lot of Bible. Even though they've been around a long time, and they can pull out their 15-year discipleship card. They're muttering. Grumbling. He says, I can't believe it. You celebrate over that brother that messed around with prostitutes and you, and you killed a fatty cat. You didn't even give me goat chops. Nothing. Do you sense a little bitterness right there? Shh. You see, this young man also was lost. He was lost and lonely inside the church. I think we've got some lonely disciples here in the church. You know, one of the things that always alarms me is when someone's not happy. See, it's the heart of God to celebrate. We just see that. It's the heart of God to be fired up. And and when you're not happy, something's wrong with your relationship with God. You know, past Friday, since I was going down the wedding, I said, man, I need some help with my sermon right here. So I sent out a quick email. I said, hey, I sent out to about 25 brothers and sisters. And I said, hey, I need some help. What are the five reasons you think people fall away? And I appreciate the 12 of you that got back to me. I sincerely thank the 12. I I really... Very appreciative. Thank you very much. Meant a lot. You know, one of the things, if you're you're visiting with us, we're family here. And, and, And we like to kid each other a little bit. We tease a little bit. And every once in a while, there's a little zinger. Just like in the family, because we have a conviction in our church that we're going to make every effort to get back to anybody that contacts us by phone or email or text within 24 hours. Let me run that by family. Okay. We have a conviction in this church that within 24 hours, if someone emails us or texts us or calls us, we're going to get back with them. And church said, that shows the heart of God. I mean, you can't imagine a shepherd going, oh, we're missing the sheep, but... Okay, well... Maybe I'll call him a few days from now and see if he comes back or something. With the 12 people that did respond, though, seriously. Um, they came back with some great ideas, and so I had to change my list and expand it to seven. And I thought that was good, because, you know, you, you've heard of the seven warning signs of cancer. These are the seven warning signs of falling away. Number one, what's the first reason? The world. The world. This person doesn't see their soulmate in the church. They don't see anybody they want to date or or marry. And they're attracted to the world. Often this is accompanied with an addiction. Even though we repent of our sins, sometimes there's still an addiction of drinking, of alcohol, and even sexual addiction. Such things as pornography and immorality and, and even homosexuality. I mean, I don't know if you saw this week. I mean, 
the United States military is now going to be doing gay marriages. I mean, that's, that's how much it's permeated our society. That's, that's how much that gay revolution has pounded things down. They're, they're, they have a loud voice. They're not afraid to be persecuted. When are true disciples going to stop being afraid of their convictions and take a stand for the truth? First reason people fall away is the love of the world. Number two, persecution. Persecution. We're called a cult, brainwashed. The commitment's too much. The doctrine, too narrow. You gotta be baptized to be saved. You gotta be a disciple when you're baptized. And we're persecuted. Of course, he talks about that in the parable of the soils. In the second soil, how the seed grows, but then the scorching hot sun, representing the hot persecution, comes and it dies because there is no root. Number three is greed. Also in the parable of the soil, it talks about how the seed goes and there are thorns and thistles that grow up and wrap their arms around the plant that was growing. And what are the thorns and thistles that stop the growth of a person in the Lord? The Bible says, the worries of this light and the deceitfulness of will. How does that manifest itself? It's by people who miss church saying, well, my job, i got to put food on the table for my family. It sounds so spiritual. When it's an issue of you being lazy and lacking sacrificial mindset to do whatever it takes to seek the kingdom first. Even marriage retreat. Well, I, I have my job this Saturday. Hey, you've known about the marriage retreat for 11 months. Don't tell me you couldn't have gotten somebody to take your shift on Saturday. The issue is, you love your money, and you love your comfortable life, and you're not seeking first the kingdom, and you are on your way out of the kingdom of God. Number four is pride. I know better than my disciple. I know better than the church leadership. I mean, I can handle dating without dating rules. I can handle being alone with the girl for several hours in the back seat of a car. After all, we're just talking. Interestingly enough, this person who's prideful, I know better, they get bitter. Because after a while, when they start doing it their own way, and they're no longer being led by the Spirit, genuinely, that, quote, feeling leaves them. One of the sisters wrote that. When the feeling leaves them about being in the Lord. Number five, sentimentality. Relationships become more important than God. Certainly we can see that if friends or family are persecutors, they try to take you out of the church. Say, oh, I miss the relationship. Can't you? They try to get you. Interestingly enough, I was talking to someone who had fallen away many years ago, and um, this person says, yeah, you know, for the first three years I was a disciple, I was on fire. I was baptized the campus. I was preaching the word. I was going at it. I loved every part of being a disciple. And then our church started to send out mission teams. And the people that I loved were sent out on the teams. And I wasn't. And I began to grow bitter. And of course, those could be for a couple of reasons. Number one, they weren't picked for the team. Or number two, my, all of my relationships are gone. If you're here in the church only because of your human relationships, Satan's going to just swipe you right out of the church at some point. And this is very important because we're going to send out a lot of mission teams, guys. Number six, number six reason for falling away is you do rather than be. In other words, I have my quiet time every morning. I go to church Sunday, Wednesday, Bible talk, devotional. You're faithful in your commitment, but what's happened is you begin to substitute commitment for emotional relationship. And after a while, the commitment, the cross grows heavy. You become weary and you begin to lose heart. And then Satan comes at you. And you're out of the church. And number seven... Some people might say that it's Satan, but it's not. 
Satan's never the ultimate reason that you fall away. The ultimate reason you fall away is you. You are the ultimate reason. What's number seven? You do not understand the grace of God. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. It was amazing that Crystal read that this morning. 1 John chapter 1. Please, everybody turn there. John writes in verse 6, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son purifies us from all our sin. Well, right here, this is a simple verse. But it's one that many disciples, young disciples particularly, don't understand. You know, bottom line, the Bible says that even after you become a Christian, you're going to sin. Yeah. Amen? But you know how it is for all of us. We long for that night. We long for that morning. That very first time that we were baptized, we came into contact with the blood of Christ. I mean, were you fired up or not? Were, I mean, honestly, were you fired up or not? You remember when you got baptized? That, that sense of clean. It was incredible. And then you remember when you messed up that first time. How dirty you felt. Well, to some extent, it's a misunderstanding of the grace of God. The grace of God is way beyond what most of us think. He says, now, if you're perpetually walking in darkness, I don't care if you're attending church or not, you, you are lost. And he says, but if you're striving to walk in the light and striving to have fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The word right there is in the perfect tense, and it's a continuation. So, when we are baptized, we share in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Romans 6. We come in contact with blood, and so we're raised out of that water, clean, because of the blood of Christ. Here's the exciting thing. As a disciple, you walk in, so to speak, a perpetual shower of the blood of Christ. As exciting as the day you were baptized is, that day, that feeling should be with you right now. Is that incredible? If you are striving to walk in the light. You know, like some of us have the feeling like, they walk along campus and go, oh my God, there's a, there's a, there's a pretty girl right there. It scopes her on out. Oh, oh, I just fell away. God, please forgive me. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, I'm back in the kingdom again. A few hours later, oh, there's another one. Oh, 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 God, I fell away again. I'm sorry. Oh, man. I'm having a tough day, God. It's kind of in and out of the kingdom today. <laughs> and no wonder we go up and down and up and down. And sometimes our downs get so far down, we just go ahead and fall away. Instead of understanding that the blood of Christ, as long as we're striving to walk in the light, that the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us when we understand God's grace. How could we ever turn our backs on Him and fall away, church? If you have even one of those seven warnings, you need to repent. You need to get help today and get back strong with the Lord. You know, it is an exciting time in our congregation. Uh... Certainly within the church here, but all the more so all around the world. I mean, even, even that song had that line, It's time to come together. It's up to you. What's your pleasure? Everyone around the world, come on. Let's celebrate. You know, today in Madrid, Spain, we have a new remnant group. Is that fire you on up or not? It's time to celebrate. You know, I can't wait for next summer when the, when the mission teams go out. It's going to be a great time. But of course, in order to get ready for next summer, we have our four times missions contribution coming on up. And that's something that the Central Leadership Council is calling all of our family of churches to. In other words, all the disciples everywhere around the world are being called to the same commitments. Because we're all... In this together, we're not autonomous. We are one movement of family of churches. 
And very interestingly, um, I, I had a, an individual approach me and he says, Don't you think this is going to burden the brothers and sisters? I said, well, it could. It really could. It depends on how they look at it. He said, well, well do you think that's going to cause them to lose their Christmas vacations? Well, I, I honestly, I, I don't know. You know, as David said, how can I offer sacrifice that costs me nothing? You know, and I, and I think about our dear brothers and sisters in Sao Paulo, Brazil. You know, amazingly, they left on a plane in LAX. August 25th. Last Sunday was September 25th. You had the seven of them. You had Raul and Linda, uh, Tyler and Shay and Malcolm and, and Joey and Margie. They're down there. Most of them don't know how to speak the language. In one month time, they now number 14 disciples. Is that awesome or not? They've had two baptisms, a restoration... And four disciples from our former fellowship have come on over saying, Man, this is the church I was baptized in. But you know, it's, it's been a challenge. Last week, in one of the homes where the disciples were staying, Margie was there, and she was held up at gunpoint. At gunpoint. The team's computers were taken, their phones were taken, Clothes were taken. Even some of Raul and Linda's kids' toys were taken. Yes, that's the challenge. And I don't think any of them are coming back for Christmas. Oh, they're going to miss Christmas vacation. Why would they miss Christmas vacation? Why would they miss the comfort and, quote, safety of America? Just one reason. Jesus Christ. That's the reason. And they're already making a difference. Does that fire you on up or not? You know, if that weren't enough, two weeks ago they were disfellowshipped by our former fellowship. Of course, it's wrongly disfellowshipped. But now, you know, that group's got to really start thinking about if you're opposing the movement of God, you're fighting God. This is pretty serious. But so there's a statement being made by those dutiful seven disciples that decided to leave Los Angeles and to go to 22 million lost souls in Sao Paulo, Brazil. They are making the statement that they love the Lord their God more than they love their own comfort and safety. They love the Brazilian people, the lost Brazilian people, more than they love their comfort and safety. Yes, they love the Brazilian people more than they love their Christmas vacation. They are putting their lives down. And the Central Leadership Council is calling all of you to lay down your lives at a truly Thanksgiving missions contribution. Can you get behind the church? You know, next, next summer is going to be awesome. You know, in America, we call church plant things part of our Samaritan project. Next summer, we're going to do Boston with Colton and Mandy Rowan. Amen? We're going to do San Francisco with Mike and Brittany Underhill. And we're going to do Orlando with the Sullivans. And if that weren't enough, we have our Crown of Thorns project, which is 12 international cities. We've decided that we're doing Paris, France with the Kernans. But you know, it, it just became obvious in the church that we have a few Latino disciples in the City of Angel Church. And so plans are being made at this very hour, not only to do Boston, San Francisco, Orlando, and Paris, but plans are being made to send out a mission team to Mexico City, Mexico. Here's the thing, church. It's going to require sacrifice. As David said, there's no sacrifice unless it costs you something. But you know, justice with the rejoicing shepherd, the jubilant housewife, and the parting father 
Hey, there's a party going on around here. And you know something? It's a celebration to last throughout all the years and then into eternity. God bless you.